breaking the wall to ancient knowledge. How the digital humanities help us think about the past to invent the future. Gregory Crane, Universität Leipzig. On the 9th of November 1989, I was an assistant professor of classics who feared the subject was finished in the East. I wondered if my field would revive in a free Germany. So I'm a professor in Leipzig. How do you like my American accent? <laughs> uh, I actually already have my permanent residency here, so I never have to return. But, <laughs> but more seriously, I think I have been reflecting all day and reflecting in light also of many of the talks that I've heard so far about the degree on the one hand to which I and my colleagues have failed many of our citizens in my country, the United States of America, and how we can better serve them in the future. And it's a great challenge, and it will take us 10 or 15 years. And I think also about how grateful I am and of, for the role that Germany plays, a role that has not been as important or more important any time in the last 50 years than it is today uh, as we convene here. I'm going to talk about breaking the walls to ancient knowledge but ancient knowledge is always with us. We understand, we think in the present about the past as we make decisions about the future. And our ability to think in a respectful and disciplined way about the past constrains our ability to think about the future. And it is directly connected to the events that we have seen unfolding. So one way of summarizing this is the, to stick with spaces. How do we go from here? Sort of enclosed, elite, perfect knowledge space into the world of the present and of the future. And I am, was asked, was suggested, I think, because nobody really knows why you study the humanities, so it was suggested that I talk about why I work on this, uh, perhaps personalize it. So I'll give you three conclusions from my early career which led to the work that I described today. And the first came when I was a young Homerist, and I was studying Homer's Iliad and Odyssey as a PhD student. Uh, and I realized that to understand uh, ancient Greek epic, I had to understand Mesopotamian and uh, earlier Near Eastern epic and, and societies as well. I had to go from a space like this to a space much larger. I had to go from say a thousand years of Greece, of Greek and Latin literature, and add out another 2,000, 2,500 years of Near Eastern history and deal with a much greater chronological space. I had to deal with Sumerian, uh, Akkadian, two other languages, as well as with Greek and Latin. And even though this is just four languages, there are four very challenging languages, uh, they come in different writing systems, Here's cuneiform, and here's a complex uh, manuscript of Homer to which I will return later. This was beyond my cognitive capacity. The methods of traditional humanistic scholarship by themselves were insufficient for me to work in a disciplined fashion with even this much cultural and linguistic material. And I went into what has, is now called the digital humanities in response to this, these limitations of the human mind. Now, I, am, I think of myself as a philologist. Uh, and since we have a lot of specialized terms, I can use this here. I learned this term in 1975 when I was a first year student at the university. And it was, it, the, the definition of it that I used came from 1822 across town from here. Uh, we're in Auguste Burke addressed Friedrich Wilhelm III on his birthday, and he used Latin in the same way that I'm using English today, when Latin was the international language of science in German universities, as English now plays this role. And philology is basically anything you can do with a textual record to understand the past. And that is a, a, an expansive field. Uh, it means we use any method available. So if we have new methods entailing the use of machine learning, we do it. 
Uh, there is no traditional constraint. And scholarship evolves over generations and centuries. I think about what happened in Berlin 200 years ago when my field was first invented as I think about where my field is going in the future. The second thing that impressed me profoundly was the Iranian Revolution, uh, where the United States did not uh, had to deal with uh, our dealings, pre our previous dealings with Iran, and the Iranians didn't much like them. But this reflects an imbalance in power intellectually in the world that exists still today. Green dots are basically people who export knowledge, red dots, places that import knowledge. And you can see the imbalance even now. This is a major subject. Uh, and finally, the languages of European scholarship, French, English, German, and Italian, are too many languages and they're not enough uh, for modern scholarship. So basically I go from the Greco-Roman world, include, include the Near East, oh, we got to have all of Eurasia, uh, and actually, even if we're studying the ancient world, we have to have the whole globe. How do we deal with this? This is the challenge. This is global philology, global scholarship. Now, what are the digital humanities? Digital humanities are, digital humanities is. Uh, we don't even know, what, you know how to use this. I'll say are. And basically, the digital humanities are first a, like the space of change, that point moving line as the humanities adapt to, in the face of new methods and possibilities in the digital world. And also, the digital humanities are basically a permanent change where we must work with algorithmic methods uh, along with our traditional uh, methods of close reading and careful manual analysis. New media also take time to evolve. You start in the 1450s producing uh, printed Bibles. You end up 60 years later with the 95 Theses uh, and social change and change in who has knowledge and power. All right, so we have various falling walls. We have falling walls of access to cultural sources, 15 million books digitized, you can't see them because the law hasn't caught up, but they're there online. Uh, just second biggest uh, language in this American collection is German. <clears throat> uh, and, and in Germany, we have a smaller collection, 400,000 books. The DFG is thinking about funding work to better analyze this. It would be the equivalent of the Hubble telescope for human intellectual history, at least in Europe and a transformative work if it goes forward. I'm not the PI, so I can, I can push for it. Uh, we have a lot of different kinds of books, books in different languages, books in different formats. Uh, language includes music and mathematics, as well as human language. So there's a lot of issues. One, you know, after you've got these things photographed, what next? Uh, you need to be able to put this text into a uh, form that you can analyze it. We've gotten a lot better at automatically generating machine actionable text. And that allows us to do something, Let's see if actually this works. Okay. All right, well this should be a, an animation uh, that would unfold and let you see, oh there it goes. All right, let you see the, um, evolution of Andalusia within the Islamic world. Okay, and this is something, that is, you've seen a lot of animations. What's interesting about this is that it is derived, okay, I see. It is derived from that. Uh, so my postdoctoral associate, Maxim Romanov, or Dr. Maxim Romanov, automatically analyzed this text and generated a visualization. You can understand the visualization because it's geographic places, time, and so on. What do you do about the evidence? How do you analyze the data upon which that visualization uh, depends? And that's the trick. And so we have falling walls of close interpretation. Here is a bilingual text. We have a Greek text on one side, English on the other. It could be German, French, Italian. Notice the little yellow. That's where we've highlighted one language and see what words correspond to that in the other language, or to visualize it differently, it looks like this. We've taken a traditional publication mode 
and turned it into a dynamic data set that allows us to visualize and explore the data and to begin working with the linguistic sources almost immediately. We can add to it linguistic data of various kinds and provide a network of sources so that you can work immediately, if slowly, with sources and languages that you have not studied. You can also do things like get past trans your English or German translations, say, what are the Greek or Arabic words that correspond to an English word? Look at their context and see, for example, that, the, that you may see love in a translation of Plato, but that corresponds to eros, and that's very different from love in a translation of the New Testament. That's breaking down the wall of language and translation. So this leads to five larger falling walls. Uh, the first uh, is, and I would say in some ways the least, or it is, the, it is by itself important, but not the most important, digital scholarship, where we're seeing new forms of digital scholarship that cannot be published as a PDF. And I think we're close to a tipping point where instead of saying, where's the PDF, that's the scholarship, we're going to say, if there's just a PDF, where's the data? If it's just a PDF, how can it be scholarship in many cases? And so here, this is a publication. But to get to that publication, you have to go to a thing like GitHub. You have to go find a site that has the raw data that you can then analyze and then re, you know, rework and repurpose yourself. Second, we have citizen science, which has already been mentioned, what I would call citizen philology, uh, falling walls between expert and society. Here we have students at, a, at an undergraduate college in the United States, the College of the Holy Cross, and they're actually working together collaboratively, and this is staged, but in fact they do work together collaboratively, and they get together every Friday afternoon uh, for three hours as a club and they work on this manuscript, which is immensely complex. It is, I would have said 15 years ago, it was impossible for them to do this work. But because they have these new methods, these new digitally mediated services, they're able to create an edition, a transcription, a diplomatic edition of this text and, and to add substantively to, our, to human knowledge and it has transformed their engagement uh, with the subject and has allowed them to do things that, as I say, I would have thought were impossible. Third, we have the, the barriers between algorithmic thinking and the humanities falling. We just started a new Bachelor of Science at Leipzig. Uh, we said we might have 30 students. The Bachelor of Science is in Digital Humanities. It's in Computer Science also. We said we might have 30 students. Frankly, I hope we might get 10 to 20. Uh, we got more than 110. And this includes hardcore computer science and a knowledge of English. Uh, and we've been overwhelmed with the initial demand. We see a new kind of liberal arts education emerging, one with new foundational skills, uh, with a new kind of education that we're learning how to, to address. Fourth, new conversations about the past that go beyond the West. Uh, and so here, here is this, some Persian poetry, poetry of the poet Hafez, represented in this sort of new kind of reading environment. We have also poetry in German, Goethe's Westöstliche Divan, uh, Goethe in German about uh, Persian poetry. How do you understand that if you're not a native speaker? How do you work with that? How do we create a back and forth uh, so that it's not just Europeans publishing in English, French, German, Italian uh, about everybody else in the world and having all the, the, the academic authority as we think about the other. And so here, new kinds of collaborations that we need that are digitally mediated but also face-to-face -face that are now possible as part of a new digital humanities. Uh, so this is a new kind of scholarship. And finally, I'll end with the need for a new scholarship to break down the walls between society uh, and scholarship. This is, I put this slide in yesterday. It's a little different today. 
But notice that's a, that's a UK, UK demonstration. Uh, Pegida is our German anti-Islamic group and Trump. We all have problems. We all have challenges. We all have our work cut out for us. Thank you.